everybody, welcome to this study. <clears throat> and really, the focus is going to be on the phrase in the scripture, pay my vows. Now, that might sound like a televangelist ploy to get money out of your pockets and to shake you down for some cash, but that's not at all what we're talking about here. And in fact, when you will see, this will probably be a part one and two, and it's really part of the series of what it means to, quote, to give, and what's the concept of Nathan, to give, and when God gives, and how do you receive it, and how you steward these experiences, experiences, main focus here. There is riches in going through a process in which God brings you through a process of deconstructing you, bringing you through humility, dependence, trust, revelation of God in yourself. This is the true prophetic journey. This is what it means to have a relationship with God and his Holy Spirit in the circles within circles of this world. And the value or the treasure that you gain is in knowing God, knowing yourself, the treasure, which is the ultimate treasure, which is laying a hold of Christ and the revelation of which we have a tendency to basically cling on and to hold on to things that will destroy us. Hold on. I've got to stop this. Uh, sorry about that. I'll be squeaking away. <laughs> So <clears throat> we have to understand what paying your vows are. And I touched on this in a previous study, but what I want you to see and to know is to pay your vows, shalom, right? That's the first word. Shalom means peace. It's to make peace with, right? And the next word we're going to look at here is this idea of making peace with threshing, with winnowing. With what comes from that, what is blown away? What are the weak, beggarly elements versus what falls to the ground? It's a picture of weighty things. It's a picture of falling down to worship. It's a picture of fruit falling from the tree. What's the fruit? What's the benefit? Right? What is the weighty thing that comes from it that remains, that is um, gathered at the end? OK, this is so important. So what I'd like to do is just touch on the document real quick and try to get us into what is the work of the Holy Spirit? What is the work of of separating man from his sins or man from his idols or person from these things that so easily besetting us? And how do we better or in a salvific way, in a saving way, really lay a hold of the ultimate pearl of great price, the great treasure of heaven, Christ, the eternal one. All right, this is so important. All right, here we go. Good to see you guys. Good to have you guys here. So let's look at our document. Let's take a look. So the idea of giving, but this is why I want to just touch off. It's a kind of an orientation in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 19. It says, but godliness with contentment. And you're going to see the idea of why I bring up contentment because it's making peace with we're going to get into here and it's going to be making peace with what? And uh, it's going to be making peace with this threshing process. It's going to be quite the study <clears throat> is great gain. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to there's a purpose. There's an end game. There's a display. There's something he wants to bring forth to be apparent. That's where the word, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The word purpose is the word showbread in the New Testament. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Certain, right? So what is the value of trekking through this life and through this world and going through the sojourn and the pilgrimage? And having food and raiment, let us be wherewith content. God will clothe us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will clothe you. He will protect you. He will provide for you. Be upon the main pursuit. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare 
and into many foolish, hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all or all kinds of evil, which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Real quick, let me just touch on this. And you're going to see that this is going to be the theme of this whole thing. Why do people build up, quote, riches? Well, it's a insulation from experiencing certain things in which you're going to have to trust and depend upon God and go through the waiting process, the trusting God when you are kind of left open and this feeling of nakedness in which you're saying, God, okay, like I'm really in a bind here. I'm really in this um, pressure point. I need you to come through. Well, it's to mitigate that. The pursuit of riches and wealth is to not go through that. But God says that is your wealth, the riches of faith and trust and knowing God who is your riches is the key to the Christian walk. And so many times money is a stumbling block unless you see it as something in which you are a conduit and which you are there to be as a steward for the gospel purposes. And you are selfless in that thinking. You're not using it for selfish gain or for this bizarre fortification, insulation, kind of fortress mentality that we tend to have in this weird, let me be the baby incubated all the time and never let me suffer the elements. God says, you'll never, never, never grow and you will stray from the faith and you'll be destroyed because you learned not that I am your provider, right? Jehovah Jireh. But flee, O man of God, flee these things and do not, what, supplement yourself from these experiences and follow after what? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Isn't this not the glory of God? Learning of God, trusting on God, the spirit leading you into these dependent, weakened places in which you have to trust in these qualities about God and by beholding you become changed. You have to intimately rely upon these qualities of God. So what is your real fight? Verse 12, <clears throat> fight the good fight of faith, trust, dependence upon trying situations in which you cannot deliver yourself. Lay hold on eternal life. Infinite. Whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses your faith and your dependency upon god is observed by people by fallen human beings and unfallen worlds you are a witness a testimony your faith your trust your dependence not freaking out not running to the nearest kind of comfort in which satan reaches out to you and gives you something to mitigate that experience and deliver you strangely from the hand of god's circumstances Verse 13 says, <clears throat> here, let me kind of, this is a little smaller. Sorry about this little adjustments here. There we go. So I give you charge in the sight of God. This is our whole life orientation is in the sight of God before God, before his eyeballs. Nothing is hidden by him. He sees everything naked for exactly for what it is. No shadow of turning. And he's telling us that when he's guiding our experiences, he's a faithful shepherd who quickeneth all things. And before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession by what? Submitting in fear, freaking out, saying, deliver me. What did he do before Pontius Pilate? He says, you have no authority. Whatever you do, God has allowed. What a good confession. What a witness he bore when he was being judged. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dependence, naked dependence upon the bridegroom, even though circumstances are telling you to cover yourself, to protect yourself, to mitigate, and to not have this experience, to alleviate yourself illegitimately, to not run the race lawfully. That's Satan's temptation, right? Which in his times, 
he shall show who is the blessed and only potent. God is sovereignly in charge, even when you're under trial, even when you're in the storm, even when you are being tested. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Who do you think is coming in the clouds of glory? In whom are you trusting until that day? Who alone or only has immortality? Forget about what Satan is trying to terrify you and make you think that he holds your life in his hand. Who alone has immortality? Dwelling in the light. This is going to be the big key of this study today. What does it mean to walk in the light, to dwell in the light, to abide in the light, to deal uh, soundfully with yourself while you are standing in the light? In other words, pay your vows, right? Shalom, and this is this whole word of Shalom being at peace with the threshing floor and what yields from that, which no man can approach unto. You're going to find yourself unholy the closer you get to God. and You'll see this played out as we approach uh, God in the promptings of the Holy Spirit to come close, to draw near to him. Whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. See this whole amen? That's, that's the bottom line. So, Timothy, right, charge them that are rich in the world that they might not be high-minded. Whoa, that's the big one right now. High-minded. What's the high-mindedness? Well, when you have mitigated, in other words, you have buffered yourself from any real consequence of trusting in God, and he is there throttling your experiences. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is bringing you through a process of learning, experience, and development in which you are learning how to trust him and his character is being carved upon your soul. He is literally carving with his finger the Ten Commandments of God upon you because you are in a sonship relationship, heirship relationship with him. The problem is when you have popped out, you've ejected out of that process, you get high-minded, arrogant, presumptuous. Nor trust in uncertain riches, right? Hey, I got this. I got nothing to worry about. Then you become pretentious, presumptuous. You think that you're handling things and you're not, and you are saving yourself from the very things that God himself has designated for your character, for your soul. But in the living God, is it not a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, to actually trust him and see what he does with that living God? actual live action, trusting in the moment, in real time process. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And it's not just talking about money, it's talking about trials and tests, experiences in which you learn. The only real treasure that matters is how to lay a hold of the robes of Christ's righteousness and trusting him in real circumstances, real faith. Faith that saves. He gives us, that's our true riches, right? That they do good, right? All things work together for, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter how trying, work together for good. Agathe would be in the Greek. But what's this good? Overall well-being of all things, shalom, that they may be rich in good works, ready to what? Distribute, willing to communicate, willing to be the vessel in which God's glory is made, displayed, manifest. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation. These are the real treasures, you guys. Faith and trust and dependence upon God, enriching other people with your experience of trust. A good foundation against the time to come. What if you're trusting in uncertain riches? What if you are talking big about everyone else may do this, but you won't Peter style? But you haven't been tried or tested yet, but you've insulated yourself successfully, manipulated and always found a way to um, remove yourself from the vulnerability of a situation and not letting God deliver you. That's the only way you're going to be prepared for, quote, the time to come. 
that they may lay hold on eternal life. I wonder if eternal life at all is a part of this whole thing. Eternal life. Wow. So, that's what we're going to look at here. Shalom Nedar. This is what we're going to look at here. Now, a lot of times we don't see the value of going through these heavy, trying circumstances. We're thinking this has no value, no good to it. And uh, even something as worldly and as fleshly is what I went through uh, yesterday was my birthday. And I spent uh, the last couple days passing two kidney stones. And at first I didn't know it was a kidney stone. So I'm in just literally on the floor sweating, sick, weeping, almost passing out, rolling around in unbearable pain, and then being raced to the hospital thinking something bizarre, like a burst appendix or something. And I'm literally, and I don't go through these dramatics at all. And I'm on the floor in the hospital waiting room, moaning and sweating. And uh, while they finally come in after a while, took felt like it took forever, brought me in. And I went through this nightmarish process and eventually found out I had two nice sized kidney stones. I'm passing. And what did I get out of that experience? Do you know what went through my mind when I was slobbering on the floor of that hospital uh, waiting room? And they're trying to like poke me and I'm moving around. Stuff like blood is shooting everywhere. I mean, it was a mess. And the spit and the almost vomiting and the sweat and everything else. What I was, in fact, thinking about was the second resurrection and what it's like to wake up outside of Jasper walls and there's no hope because there's nothing you can do at that moment and how this must be even nothing like that moment. The infinite, eternal regret where you really wake up, your eyes are really open and you never laid a hold of eternal life, not legitimately. It was all presumption this side of the return of Christ. And all I thought about is, I want to save anybody from that experience. There is no enemy that I would want to really suffer that level of horror and hopelessness and torment of soul in which you cannot deliver yourself from that. And just the tiniest piece of that through a kidney stone was enough for me to be thinking, thank you for this experience. Thank you for getting me in touch with what the real impetus, the real catalyst for evangelism is that you are fast forwarded to that second resurrection and that you are there to literally pull people out of the burning lake and out of the fire in a pre-fire rescue. Aware fully and empathizing fully with that day. And that's how you're speaking to people. And this is the work that we are to do in evangelism And we are to spare ourselves from this experience. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in trying to take us through the threshing process. I hope you're kind of getting that. Christ cried out in Psalms 22 verses. We're just going to do verse 25. Eli, Eli, Lama, the abandonment of God, Lama Sabachthani. And this was Psalms 22. And this is part of his experience. And this is something you'll see with Job. You'll see this with Jonah. You'll see this, that God brings his favorite people through this, quote, paying your vows. I don't think it's a great translation. I'm going to tell you what the translation I think would fit. And I'm going to give it to you right here in the Hebrew. And so here it is. It says, my praise shall be of thee, of you, God, in the great congregation, right? The eternal congregation, the great cloud of witness above on that day. I will pay salam, shalom, peace, be at peace to make peace with my neder, my drop down, fall down from the flesh, from the threshing winnowing. Here it is. Drop down the grain neder from the winnowing instrument upon the threshing floor. Right. This is uh, the idea of sowing and scattering this idea to vow. It's more like a picture of things being separated during the threshing process. This is what it's trying to say and what what we're trying to say. And it's this idea of um, to make peace with right to make peace, to submit oneself to to be 
entreaty. In other words, to submit yourself to, to the dominion of someone, specifically to commit one's affairs to God. In other words, obedience and submission. It's this thrashing floor concept before them that fear him. See what's going on here? This is the, quote, pay your vows. Pay your vows is being content when God brings you in through a trial and you are not going to try to wiggle and worm yourself out of it, but allow the carving and the experience and the work of the Holy Spirit to be upon you. Now, right now, I'm going to skip over a lot of the Jonah stuff. I mean, maybe I'll touch on it real quick. But I'm going to move into some things, and we're going to have to part two this thing. Hey, good to see you, uh, Brother Joseph. And to really understand the work of the Holy Spirit, because oil in your lamp, when the ten virgins were waiting for the bridegroom, and five were foolish and five were wise, five had oil in their lamp. How do you get the Holy Spirit? How do you continue in the Holy Spirit? How do you be in the continual flow of the Holy Spirit? This is exactly what we're talking about. And you're going to see when Jesus Christ was speaking to Nicodemus, he's saying, you don't know where the Holy Spirit's coming from. You don't even, what you're going to see is his work happening, but there's going to be a serpent presented before you that's hanging upon a pole. And you're going to have to see yourself as a sinner and be born again. And you're going to have to allow yourself to be brought to the light. So judgment does not come upon you. And Nicodemus is like, what, what are you talking about saying you need to be born again. You need to see your, have your sins shown to you. You need to be presented literally this healing emblem in which someone else is bearing your poison, your curse, your sin, and you're going to have to see yourself like you're looking in a laver, and there's going to have to be a lamb burning uh, on an altar from the foundation of the world to give you hope as the Holy Spirit is leading you to your sins. And there are people that are going to back away from the light because if you want to have the Holy Spirit, you have to be in the light, remain in the light. And then where God sees and looks from his vantage point at everything in yours and mine life, we will have to keep our feet in that place and allow God to take us through this winnowing threshing process in which Satan is our accuser. We stand there not giving excuses and we allow Christ to defend us and to give us a robe exchange. And that process is over and over and over again. That's how you have the Holy Spirit. That's how you keep the Holy Spirit. That's how you grow and mature and become stabilized where you're not tossed to and fro with every wind of accusation, every trial, every circumstance, and you are not to be sparing yourself insulating yourself, mitigating and throttling these experiences like the good control freaks that were really good at being, and then we tried to spiritualize it, and then we tried to sell it and pawn it off to God, and God's not buying it. And that's the foolish virgin. Pay your vows. Be at peace with the threshing. And Jonah prayed, right? This was somebody who thought that they can make these bizarre deals with God and then change the deal. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly, right? From a place of a living tomb experience. And he says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, day of atonement, to afflict, day of atonement. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. Nice little fast forward to what it's like when you're going to be condemned. And you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. This is a little foretaste of Calvary's cross and your sins surrounding you, right? All your billows and all your ways passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward what? Your holy temple. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Though darkness has swallowed me up and... It's, it looks like you've forsaken me. The water surrounded me, even to my soul, right? The picture of being drowned under the sea, according to your sins, judged like the flood. The deep closed about me. Weeds are wrapped around my head, a crown of thorns, condemnation, becoming sin incarnate. That's exactly what the wicked are going to go through. The second resurrection, they're going to have a crown of thorns. They will become sin incarnate. No good thing. I went down to the moorings and to the mount of the mountains and the earth with its bards were behind me. It's going to be a stage for your execution, this planet. 
this world, this threshing floor on the second resurrection. It will be turned into a lake of fire. And you have brought me, excuse me, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God, when my soul fainteth within me, I, Lord, remember me. Right? Thief on the cross. Foretaste of Calvary here. Calvary was a foretaste of the second resurrection that Jesus died for, the second death. Listen to this. And my prayer went to you into where your holy temple, the heavenly sanctuary. Is this a nothing burger, the heavenly sanctuary? Really? Those who regard worthless idols, you're going to see this. This is exactly the weird Insulating, fortifying ourselves against, incubating ourselves, taking the hand of the devil in the warm of the night, false images and comforts that we give ourselves. These will be the idols that we cast from us on that day. We comforted ourselves with these idols, these images. Forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Here it is. Shalom Nidar. Salvation is of the Lord. My grace is sufficient. To thy hands I commit my spirit. So the Lord spoke to the fish. And finally, that's when it vomited out Jonah on dry land. The word dry, very fascinating. We'll really get into the study uh, when we do the part two of this threshing. But we're going to get into is the work of the Holy Spirit and really try to understand what it means to have the Holy Spirit at the coming of Christ. So we go into the wedding chamber. See, the fool receives no instruction. The fool does not want discipline or chastisement or correction or instruction. The fool wants to live in their self crafted fantasy, their own virtual reality narratives. And they really think that they get enough people to agree with them that somehow that's going to fortify them against the wrath of God. And what we're going to find out in today's study is, nope, you did not enter into the threshing floor. And then when you get threshed at that time, you will be the chaff that blows away like the wicked. So what I'm going to do is bring us down. Uh, we're going to go past some things we're going to go into next uh, study, and we're going to go right into something I think is going to be very powerful, very fascinating. The work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is a pay your vow threshing floor, making peace with it, and having a right relationship with your experience so you can have the Holy Spirit, be afflicted, be matured, be developed, get single minded, and be ready for the return of Christ. So, here comes a master teacher teaching somebody who thought he was a good teacher. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's no mysterious conversation here. What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit moving in your life with this kind of, quote, wheels within wheels, circumstances in which you see the effects of God moving in your life, the providence and the hand of God, and the many different things that he is setting in order, many dominoes that are falling, the various chariot wheels, then chariot wheels, and the various circumstances of our life. It's God moving. It's God operating. It's the picture of the wheels within wheels, that there's hands and eyes on these wheels, and it's God's providence moving in your life to try to bring us to a place to see his glory. And it's going to be through trial and affliction. It's going to be through testings. It's going to be through the stripping off of our idols, through the breaking down of our fortresses, of our citadels, of our hiding places. It's going to be the removal of our idols, wheels within wheels. But God says in this threshing floor experiences, you're going to see here, I won't crush you. You will be broke, but I won't crush you. You will be separated from the chaff, but I won't crush you. You will have the winnowing process, but the wheat will not be crushed. Paul himself talks about this, his own experience. Hey, I'm being tried in many ways, but I'm not being destroyed. 
That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's spiritual maturity. That is preparation. That is giving you supreme faith, high quality faith, the highest, most optimal, the most opulent faith. Real faith, Jacob time of trouble, faith, Jesus on Calvary's cross, faith, Red Sea parting, faith, real faith, not presumption. Truly, you have been blanched out. You see no way in which you can deliver yourself, and you have to rely upon the hand of God and the qualities that exist in God, his mercy, his goodness, his tenderness, his forgiveness, his caregiving. And then you can sing true and proper praises and give testimony witness that you relied upon these qualities about God. So the wind blows as it wishes. Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. God has a way of working circumstances and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. But you know God is working. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit, to be quickened of the Spirit, to recognize the work of the Spirit, to be in a cooperative relationship and not resisting the Holy Spirit, not insisting that the work of the Holy Spirit is Satan, not making everything that the Spirit brings you to that will bring you to humility and meekness and all these gentle qualities that will soften you down and round out your edges, you cannot attribute that to an evil quality about God. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Wow, blindness. This is a rich man here and he has a hard time seeing. And Jesus said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Be careful that you're not trusting in deceitful um, buffeting yourself, giving big margins for your life, riches. You're not really experienced in God. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know testify what we've seen you do not receive our witness you have no idea of what it's like to totally rely upon god you have enriched yourself and you have insulated yourself so you are teaching you're a teacher in israel and yet you know nothing of what it's like to just hang upon god and the abyss is just trying to swallow you from below like a mega serpent and yet you're teaching Verse 12 says, if I have told you earthly things that you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Things that are in the unseen world to trust in the riches which is in heaven that you cannot see that are at the right hand of God. Verse 14 says, right here, he's going to, I'm just skipping to that because right here, we're trying to see that God never shows you these terrible, horrible things in which you get to see all the flaws and all these condemnable things about yourself without showing himself as the lamb slain or as the serpent hung between heaven and earth, bearing our curse. God never has you go into that look-see, into that peekaboo revelation horror show, which is your, your soul, without giving you the supreme comfort and assurance that he will be hung between heaven and earth. He will pay the price for your shame and condemnation. But that doesn't mean you don't walk in in the light and come into the revelation of these things in which all these things are exposed so you can understand the mercy, you can understand the graciousness, you can understand the forgiveness of God instead of these long-distance kind of praises. What about real experiences, really trusting in God? Red Sea stuff, different world. So, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Because I'm about to show you some stuff 
You want to walk in the light as I'm in the light? Does God live in darkness? Does God live in in all the false narratives that we use to kind of cover our shame? No, he lives in the blinding reality and the nakedness of these things. To walk in the light as he is in the light and you will have fellowship with God and he'll cover your nakedness, right? Verse 15 says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sweet and mega major infinite panoramic assurance that he's giving you. For what is he telling you here? What massive assurance for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever Nicodemus believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You want to be a son of God, be disciplined, be chastised, be spanked, be told the truth. Don't make me your enemy because I tell you the truth. We'll, we'll, we'll touch on that in Galatians. Verse 16 says, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to do what? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Are you my child? Will you let me tell you the truth? Verse 18 says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe or trust or rely or depend upon him is condemned already. Why? Because you're hiding in the dark and you have your own provisions and you've covered yourself up well. Thank you very much. You draw near him with your lips, but your heart is far from him. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And we're just thinking, what? It's just some, oh yeah, I believe Jesus Christ. No, no, no. And the name is his character, his Shem, his character to trust, to rely upon him in real circumstance, in real condemnation, shame, and accusation, and all the shame that washes over your soul in which we come running and fleeing to all these destructive alternatives in which we cover ourselves, in which we costume ourselves, but we still... We'll talk about God and give him these big, empty, far away praises, but we won't bring our own soul and be in the light as he's in the light and live in the truth instead of these weird fantasies. Yes, I do know of Orthodox Christianity. All right, guys, so let's keep going through this. And this is the condemnation that the light, this is what it means to walk in the light as he's in the light. We're going to get further into this. That's coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What is this darkness? Well, this darkness is the darkness of the Gentiles that he tells in Ephesians 3 and 4, etc. He's just talking about the way in which we are building up these false narratives about our deity, <clears throat> about our <clears throat> how we image ourselves how we comfort ourselves and we manage ourselves and how we get by, by these false narratives in which they're full of fantasy. It's not meek and humble and trusting, a wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. It is not saved by grace because I'm a wretched sinner. No, it's rich and increase of goods, have need of nothing. And we act like we're doing God a favor because he got to save wonderful, beautiful, peacock plumed, exotic bird of paradise me. <clears throat> so, we go on. <clears throat> For everyone practicing evil hates what? The light. These games we play, we don't want them exposed. We don't want God to tell us the truth. We don't want these things exposed and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. We'll talk about some examples. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. What does that even mean in God? Trusting in God, right? Understanding that when God brings us through these circumstances, not to destroy us, it's to show us his goodness to show us his mercy, to show us his forgiveness, to show us his graciousness, to show us what he does to a naked, shivering sinner that is waiting upon him, trusting in him. Hupamone, oh, excuse me, um, what's what we're looking for? Um, yeah, Hupamone, resting and trusting in him under the pressure, but not fleeing to your self-justification, not fleeing to your excuses, not fleeing to your old wine skin, your old garment, not putting your old 
uh, uncircumcised flesh to cover you again, but remaining open and vulnerable and seeing what God does with your open, vulnerable, naked, trusting, patient self when you feel the shame washing over you, right? <clears throat> Brother Daniel, let's see. It's too bad, bro, that uh, you can't stay focused on the study and you're here pushing denominationalism. And uh, it's really sad that you can't get a hold of this. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> Hold on. All right, so here we go. Back to John 9, verses 3 through 5. Neither this man nor this man's parents sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must, okay, real quick. The reason why I went here, you guys, is this. Is... Yeah, next time I'll get a mediation for this. Unfortunately, this is where this dude is at. So <clears throat> what I want to show you guys is that a lot of disciples thought something bad happened to this guy or happens to you or happens to us because of some bad thing that somebody had done. Maybe your parents sinned. Maybe you sinned. And so we have a blind guy here that was blind from birth and Christ is saying, no, no, no. Some things happen to reveal something about me. I'm at work. This come into the light as I'm in the light and I have to do my work is the work of the Holy Spirit, is the work of revelation, is the work of showing that you were blind, now you could see. You were in the darkness, now I'm showing things to you. You were somehow covering yourself with these narratives by the, they call the darkness of the mind of the Gentiles, which is what? The gospel is foolishness why would you be vulnerable when the greeks showed you nothing but social and psychological perfection how to be quote made into a hellenist a child of the sun and of light and of intelligence and of wisdom and of perfect physical specimenship an ubermensch why would you be lowly why would you be humble why would you be meek why why would you put yourself at a disadvantage and let God expose your weakness and bring you into a place of humility and meekness? Why? That's foolishness. You see, the darkened mind is constantly trying to save yourself from that experience and doing everything you can to try to be what? Untouched. Unimpacted. Not vulnerable. Look at what Pentecostalism does. No, I'm Dutch. I'm a prophet. Don't talk to me this way. I am a special messenger of God. I'm in a high place. Therefore, I should be immune from such experiences. Word, faith stuff. Even in circumstances where God, he's trying to bring you to the light as he's in the light. He's trying to show you what he sees, what is before him on this day of atonement. And yes, it is an affliction to our soul. That's for sure. And it's hard for us to understand why God would give us light and also allow us to go through such great pain and light being the source of that pain because we can't live in our fantasy world that we've used as a way to compensate or to cope with the truth about ourselves. Too dangerous. It's a drug. So here we go. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. I'm a capitalized D. Night is coming when no one can work. God cannot work with you when you are in the darkness of your soul, the darkness of your denial, the darkness in which there's no Holy Spirit to reveal these things in which you could seek God and the qualities of your high priest 
mediating for you in heaven. There comes a day where he just sends you off into the darkness like he sent Judas. Go into the night. Satan will enter into you. There comes that day where he hands the wicked over to the darkness and says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. The presence of Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit as his representative is a great revelation to us. Well, I'm going to touch on here. I'm going to quote these next verses and talk about what it's like to be in the light as he is in the light. And this is going to be a very painful situation for us. But check this out. It says, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The one another is us in God. And then you could secondarily apply it to us in fellowship. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Because why does, is this being put together? Because it's telling you that to walk in the light, your sins will be exposed. Your shame spots will be exposed. Walk in the light is the most holy place where there's the Shekinah. There's no shadow of turning. And everything that you don't want to see about yourself is exposed. And yet it causes greater humility, but also greater dependence and trust upon these merciful qualities about God. So we need to know that if we're walking the light as he is in the light, dwells in the light, there's no darkness whatsoever in his presence, that we need to know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. A serpent being hung from a pole stuff, having the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to go into denial, it's going to be to your own destruction, right? So <clears throat> if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You think denial is going to work? You think this weird denial trip, this knee-jerk reaction reflex that we have in denial, do you actually think it's going to kill us when God exposes these things? Or do you think and that we're going to destroy our ability to have eternal life? Or do you think that we're going to be okay hiding in the darkness, covering ourselves with our idolatry, and somehow it's going to play out okay in the end? We deceive ourselves, and what, are you ready for this? Not good news here, and the truth is not in us. See, the difference between the wicked and the righteous is one person loves the truth, and the other person hates the truth. And they believe the lie of what? That they are gods, they shall not surely die. And they are living in their own fantasy world, thinking that it's a buffer against the wrath of God, and it's not. If we, what's what's the admonition here? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is what it means to dwell in the light, to walk in the light. This is what it means to Romans chapter eight, to walk in the spirit, to walk in the light, to walk in the truth. And the spirit's gonna reveal these things about us and we're gonna have to trust in the merits of Jesus Christ and what he did upon Calvary's cross to have assurance to press in to greater light greater exposure of sin, greater revelation as to your sinfulness, but greater revelation as to God's mercy and his love for us. Well, what if we want to cling on to the fact that, nope, we're going to go ahead and just self-justify and we don't want to see these things? Verse 10 says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, not the messenger. We make him the liar and his word is not in us. Now, it's real interesting here. We'll touch on some more verses here. But I've had dear brothers, dear brothers that I love, like I love my own, like my best friend type brothers. And I know what the journey is to have self-exposed. I know what it's like to have the dark, shameful spots being exposed. I know what it's like to have things that God is revealing to you that he knows, and the most painful part is if it's ever known by other people, and they see it, and God even gives them eyes to see it. It's a very, very painful thing. It's super painful, and God only takes it to that level if when he reveals it to you, you push it back. 
and you want to play games and you don't want to be authentic with God, well, guess what's going to happen? He's going to move it from a private revelation to now somebody that's very close to you and loves you dearly and is there to be as a vessel of mercy and, and of forgiveness and of love and of grace. But the shame part takes over. I've seen it. I've been in more than one of those circumstances. And what I found to have happened is certain themes that you kind of start seeing. Like in my life, the theme is these, a lot of these dear brethren that I'm closely associated with will have the issues around these strange relationships uh, in their mother's lives where they become kind of the pseudo husband to their mom. The weird thing that starts to happen through this entire process is they um, enjoy being someone that wields a lot of great theological truths and insight, but in reality, they themselves are very vulnerable to this idea of needing this kind of mother rescue in their life. And I've lost some very dear brethren to this. And they have submitted that was their idol that they were even disrespectful to their own fathers because of the weird subtext cute that they were getting from their mom saying hey listen you're going to keep your father down here and i'm going to keep you in this high position and we're all teamed up against your dad or against my ex-husband or my present husband and then there's a silent covenant that somebody will make to try my brothers did this with my mom and then there's the great competition of my two brothers, who's going to win over my mom? And again, I've seen this over and over and over again become an idol that is very difficult to cast off, especially when God ex exposes that in your life, and then you feel the shame washing all over you. They did not want to remain in the light. They loved the light as long as it didn't touch these super close idols. These idols in which these kind of unspoken games in the family dynamics are playing themselves out. And they didn't want to relinquish that because it's a very powerful thing to kind of have this Oedipus rule over your father and you're kind of doing the pit bull work for your mom. Then you get to become, my brother did the same thing. So my, my middle brother who died and my mom has died too. That's why I could talk openly about this is that he was in competition with my youngest brother who was the golden child initially. And I didn't want anything to do with this even as a kid. And that's why I was cast out early is like, well, you're not playing this weird, sick family game. And therefore, since you're not playing, we don't like you. So they took the ball and they didn't let me play. So I joined the Navy. But in reality, I do get this situation. My two brothers were fighting over who was going to get my mom. So one would do one thing to you know, manipulate my mom to try to capture her affections and the other would do one thing and one person would get in trouble and the other person would get in trouble and, and seeing who was going to win in the long game. I seem to attract those people in my life that are in this vicious kind of cycle of who's going to win mommy's heart. And then the mother tends to, you know, present herself as a good Christian or whatever else, but this is her secret idolatry. She's playing into all this kind of stuff, but she still wants to be called a good Christian, raised in a good Christian home. Etc. And these are these unspoken games. So the Holy Spirit isn't mocked. The Holy Spirit knows this idolatry. The Holy Spirit knows these inner dynamics. The Holy Spirit knows of this bizarre Cain and Abel kind of fratrous, you know, psycho kind of circumstances in which they're all embroiled in. And I notice that when it gets down to these core issues in which you find your identity and these kind of early childhood kind of associations and role play and stuff like that, that that's when they bounce. They're able to be cool around God exposing things like you need to eat less dairy or you can't eat bacon anymore or you need to start doing more exercise. They're fine with that kind of revelation. But when it gets down to these kind of a Things. It becomes apparent to themselves. It becomes apparent to their friends. It becomes apparent to everyone around them. They think God is their enemy at that point. And God is only trying to sear them from their idols, pry their hands from that desperate idolatry and the sickness and the toxicity that all of that is. You can't be a Christian and yet participate in all this toxic stuff and say, no, but I found a good Christian label for it when the Holy Spirit is absolutely in the light on these things. These are very, very painful things. And, and anybody, Moses, to the prophets, to Paul, 
it's not fun even being a vessel in which these things are revealed and you have to bring this out in such a way that you know that that's it. That's going to be the end of your fellowship. That's going to be the end of, and you could do it with the tears and everything. I've done it. I've been there plenty of times with the humility and the pleading. I'm your advocate. This will be not exposed to anybody else, et cetera, et cetera. Never, never, never. I am here as your advocate fighting for you, but you're lying to yourself. It's exposed for everyone else to see. God has sent me to be as an advocate, as a friend, as a Barnabas to you. To release that idolatry, nope, but then they'll stay in ministry and do these things and think that they could still hold on to the ministerial robes and still think, no, I will still manage that because I was doing fine at that level and I'm putting the brakes on here. But that's how you start losing the Holy Spirit. That's where Paul says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And Paul was saying, that's why a lot of times he was having a hard time being validated as an apostle is because the super apostles were flattering people. The false teachers will flatter you. They will never allow the light to be the light and to be a vessel of the Holy Spirit so we could be here as vessels of sharp iron sharpening iron and the authenticity of really being in fellowship with one another, humbling ourselves, confessing our faults to one another, covering one another and praying for one another and realizing that we're all naked before God. We are here to minister the covering of Christ's robe of righteousness as we ourselves have been covered as we ourselves have been forgiven through confession and authenticity and nakedness before God, that you could minister that to one another. This is what it's like to have the Holy Spirit. This is what it's like to be in the true body of Christ. This is what it means to be his child. This is what it means to have eternal life. This is what it means to dwell in the light as he is in the light. It's threshing. And a lot of people didn't see the value of it when Paul was doing it. A lot of people didn't appreciate the value of it when Moses was doing it. A lot of people didn't see the value of it when Elijah or John the Baptist or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or Isaiah or David or anybody was doing that. And David didn't appreciate it. Well, he did appreciate it finally when Nathan came up to him and did it to him. So when Paul's talking about this threshing process, 1 Corinthians 9, 8 through 14 says, I am saying these things only on the basis of common sense. Or does the law not say this as well? As it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain. You notice how some ministries get highly funded for these beautiful and flattering ideas? And some ministries are barely able to scrape anything together. Why? God is not concerned here about oxen, is he? No. Or is he surely speaking for our benefit as it excuse me or is he not surely speaking for our benefit it was written for us because the one plowing and threshing ought to work in hope enjoying the harvest and i have found out personally in my experience that sowing is fine but the threshing is not appreciated and, and with all love and consideration and concern and wanting the best and looking out for these souls, you're going to see here in Galatians 4, Paul was realizing that I, you, who has bewitched you? Who has enchanted you? Who has spoken sweetly in your ear that you have become bewitched, enchanted? You lost sight of Calvary's cross. You lost sight of the serpent that was hung between heaven and earth. You're losing the Holy Spirit. And you thought to gain it through the works of the covering of your flesh and a false fleshy concept of, quote, uncircumcision in which you are, again, recovering yourselves by thinking, well, I just need to be great. First Corinthians, I just need to be great. I need to be respected. I need to be honored. James talks about it. Paul talks about it. Peter talks about it. John talks about it. They all talk about this problem in which we all start wanting this little hierarchy so we can climb the ladder and nothing can touch us, Nicolaitan. These are painful things. Tough things. Walk in the light. Verse 11 says, if we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much to reap material things from you? These guys were like, well, I don't want to be around Paul's ministry because guess what? He's going to say these things and it's going to hurt me. So I'm going to materially hurt him. And Paul was dealing with that. Alexander the coppersmith was a Jew. Brought him much problems. 
Verse 12 says, if others receive this from you, are we not more deserving? But we have not made use of this right. We've not lorded over people. There's great benefits to going through these tests and trials and having things exposed and learning to trust in Christ. Instead, we endure everything so that we may not be a hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who serve in the temple eat food from the temple? What is this quote from the temple, from the altar that he's going to talk about here? Those who serve the altar receive part of the offerings. Verse 14, in the same way, the Lord commanded those who proclaim the gospel to receive their living through the gospel. Who wants to pay someone who's going to be a vessel of sharing things that you're ashamed of? Paul's all saying, yeah, it might hurt and my letters might be weighty and it might feel like a revealing of your nakedness and your sins, but this is Levitical. This is why the Levites receive tithe, that they are ministering forgiveness, salvation, sacrifice. They are there to read the law to you, to have your sins exposed and then to lead you to an offering with a lamb. Are they not to live by that? Or are you going to project upon them and then literally see them as a scapegoat and your association with them as, well, they are in knowledge of my dirtiness, therefore I don't like the Levites. I don't like the prophets. I don't even like the word of God because the word of God abiding in you is a rod, is a discipline, is a correction, is a reproof, is a redirection is a rod of exposure and of submission. This is what it's like to be a sheep for the shepherd. This is what it's like to come as a bride under your husband. This is what it's like to be under the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to enter into his rest. Look how the people I'm losing from teaching this. This is amazing. I'll be honest with you. Even teaching this, is something where people say, I'm sorry. I, mean, I had like nine people on here now have two. I, I get it, guys. I got it. I got it. It's like, you know what? John 6. Are you also going to turn away? Many left them. Because this is the bread. This is the manna. This is what he's driving you through the wilderness to be tested and to have exposure to your own self. I get why people walk away. I got it. I'm going to look here right now. I'm going to see it's going to go down to one. I'm pretty sure of it. I get it. Many will walk away. They don't want to walk in the light as he's in the light. They may have fellowship with Christ and be in an authentic, honest relationship with him when he sees all of your nakedness already. So, Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit, being a born-again, uh, purchased and blood-bought child of God, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 through 9, 11, then 16 and 17 says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. When has Abba, Father ever cried out? On Calvary's cross and in Gethsemane? Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. What sweet assurance in whom he disciplines our sons. You're not a bastard child. Where shall we go, Sergio? That's right. And if a son in which he disciplines, then you are an heir of God through Jesus Christ. Don't be discouraged because he exposes these things. This is what he does to those in whom he loves. We don't need our little walls and our little towers and our little fleshy, uncircumcised hearts and our defense mechanisms. In our little insulators. Verse 8 says, But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not God's. In your defense mechanisms, in the ways in which you fortify yourselves, protect yourselves, hide your palaces and towers in the ways in which we save ourselves from the naked, vulnerable, shivering trust of God. Verse 9, 
But now after you have known God, walk in the light as he's in the light, and he tells himself the truth about your own naked soul, or rather be known by God, how is it that you turn again to these weak and beggarly elements that you use as a self-protection measure so you don't feel like God is showing your nakedness? to which you desire again to be in bondage. You're a slave to these devices of the flesh, of money, of sensualism, of manipulation, whatever. Weak and beggarly elements. False coverings, verse 11. I'm afraid for you lest I've labored for you in vain. And this is what happens. You try working with people all you care about is what the Holy Spirit has placed upon your heart for their interest in Christ and in trust and in dependence upon him. Now they're going to go back to these things again. These dry forms, playing church again, not in the hands of a living God that has permission to walk as you walk in the light as he's in the light. That you go through the valley and the and the peaks and everything with God, and He shows you things, and He gives you comfort, and He gives you rest, and He gives you revelation, and He brings you down to very painful experiences. Are you going to abandon God? He's not going to be your bread anymore, the bread of affliction, the bread of comfort, the bread of tears, the bread of sustenance. Verse sixteen. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? How I have found this to be so. With the dearest of my friends in which I've had sweet fellowship in their lifting of the heel, still in ministry, by the way, but they're just, they really think that they know how to do both. They know how to throttle God in, in the Holy Spirit and they know how to control the Holy Spirit. And hey, not so much Holy Spirit, God. I'm in control here. Let me throttle this. It's not going to play out very well, as you'll see. They zealously court you, but for no good. You think these are your buddies for telling you all the things you want to hear? Feeding to your ego, your fantasy. They're just drawing you right back to the old self. You just got a new spiritual religious robe but it's the old stench it's the old flesh yes they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them they have a way of making you want what they have by acting like they're elite <coughs> elite over you that's all it's talking about there so what am i trying to say is when we get into joel we're going to get into a few verses that, well i'm not gonna let this be a super long study this is just kind of an essential kind of a picture of some things. But what I do want to show you, because we're going to part two, probably part three, this too. But what I'm here wanting to show you is there is value to this threshing floor, to making peace with this. And the great riches that come is the riches of faith and trust and dependence and experience with God. This is the key. And what we're going to get into here is when you want the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of Joel chapter two, you have to understand the threshing floor is where you get all the wheat from, where you get the separation of good and evil, light things from heavy things, weighty things from light affliction things. What to hold on to, what to let go of, what to release, what to relinquish. This is so important. This holding on to these idolatrous things is destroying us. Building up our little citadels and fortresses, protecting ourselves, because we don't want the Holy Spirit to really give us a full revelation of these things that afflict us and beset us. We don't want these exposures is destroying our capacity for the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the wind that blows as God wills to do these things. To be as an oil to your lamp, that your light is for Christ and that you remain in that light. You see? We'll go a little bit further. Joel chapter two, verse 24 says, the threshing floor shall be full of wheat. Right? Make peace with the threshing floor. And the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil, the Holy Spirit. See, insulating yourself from this experience does the opposite. It, it drains you of the Holy Spirit. If you remain under these trials, you become 
imbued and doused with the Holy Spirit. Threshing floor shall be full of wheat. The vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. Micah chapter four, verse 12 says, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord, nor do they understand his counsel. For he will gather them like cheese to the threshing floor. We don't understand the wisdom of God when he does that. That's what it's saying, you guys. We don't understand the mind of God, why he says this is best that I send you to Babylon for 70 years, and then I'm going to discipline you there, and then I'm going to call you out. They don't understand the thoughts, but God says, I know my thoughts. They're good thoughts. I have a good end for whatever I put you through, allow you to go through. Nor do they understand his counsel. See, sons go into the counsel of the father and allow themselves to be mentored, for he will gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. His people, those that he loves, are going to be on a march to the threshing floor. Let's see how far I... <clears throat> I'll just go down a little bit more, <clears throat> then we'll part to this. But I think you're getting the point. The big point is that if you are going to prepare for the coming of Christ, as John the Baptist is a picture of preparing for the return of Christ for the advent, and you, this is a, quote, Elijah message or Jan, John the Baptist kind of a message here. To really understand this is always, this is how God patterns himself. You have to prepare for the return of Christ, and this is the way you do it. You go to the winnowing, you go through the, the, the winnowing fan experience of the threshing floor in which you're going to be cleansed this way. This is your only true purging. This is your only true preparation. This is how you receive the Holy Spirit to prepare you for the bridegroom that cometh wise, not fools, not self-protecting, not throttling and self-mitigating, not sitting there saying, we have to control how God brings me through a process. Release yourself into the trustworthy hands of the nail-pierced hands that literally put himself up on the cross for your benefit, bearing your curse. Don't be afraid of the process. Fear not. I am with you. We're going to don't be afraid of their faces. Let's march into the Canaan land. This is the land of giants. Let's go before Goliath, etc. Let's go before your great accuser. Let's go before your shame. Mary, let's go into the house in Bethany where Simon is there. Let's go to the place that ironically is going to be a healing like a serpent in the leading into the valley of the shadow of death. You will fear no evil and God will be there to be that healer. It's unintuitive to the flesh to face the pain. But this is how you will learn of God in that he's a rescuer, he's a savior, he's a defender, he's a protector, he's gracious, he's merciful, and he is the one that will be your, quote, vengeance. He will be the, the voracious advocate for you that you desperately need. Quit running to Satan, quit running to the flesh, quit running to the things that you are strong in, quit being wise and evil, right? Matthew chapter 3, verse 12 says, his, John the Baptist saying this, his winnowing fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. Pay vows, shalom, neder, be at peace with this but he will burn up the chaff in what? Unquenchable fire. Jeremiah 51, three says this. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like the threshing floor. Why does God allow the wicked to sometimes inflict us with things in our lives? He says, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. And when it is time to thresh her, yet a little while and the time of her harvest will come. There will be a good thing coming from this process. And you're going to see here later on, this is exactly where God is telling his people, come out of her, my people. How do you come out of Babylon? God is going to send the Holy Spirit in, bring you under affliction. And coming out of Babylon is not just about a church denominational thing. Drinking the wine of Babylon is a spiritual, psychological, also reality to it too. We comfort ourselves in Babylonian garments, Achan. In soft robes, children of Israel. We bend like the reed. We go as the wind blows. To and fro. Unstable in all of our ways, insane, psychotic, unstable. 
non-grounded, shaken easily. <clears throat> Isaiah 28, verse 26, 28 says, for he instructs him in right judgment. God is an instructor and a teacher. God teaches him. For the black cumin is not threshed with a threshing sledge. It's not going to destroy you. It's not going to crush you to powder. Nor is a cartwheel wheel rolled over the cumin. But the black cumin is beaten out with a stick and the cumin with a rod. It's not to destroy you. Bread flour must be ground. Therefore, he does not thresh it forever break it with the cartwheel or crush it with his horsemen, the four horsemen he sends. It's not to destroy you, but it's to separate you from the chaff. This also comes from the Lord of hosts of armies, who is wonderful. His name is wonderful in counsel and excellence in guidance. Listen, you're going to go through this process right here, right? This threshing. But it's not to destroy. This threshing that he's talking about here is to yield the separation from the chaff. The rod is used. He's not using the wheels to crush you down to powder. He's allowing it to be something that separates you from these things that so easily beset you. These are false coverings. This is your scubalon. This is your husk. These are these things that should be disregarded as dung. Like Paul in Philippians chapter 3. All of these things I count as but dung. False coverings. Tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day, raised up in Tarshish, right? Pharisee, next up for the Sanhedrin. Blameless externally, my life perfected, zealous for the law. All a false covering, very religious garb, soft garments. Don't touch me. Don't speak bad to me. Don't tell me these terrible things. I don't want to hear from Micah the prophet. He always tells me things that I don't want to hear, says Ahab. Quit telling me things I want to hear, said the baby king who accused Elijah of wearing soft garments. And he's wearing camel's hair. He's wearing the soft, pretty little pillowed garments. And yet he's projecting on Elijah. How much do people that I know in ministry do that? Do you want to know? Do you know what's like to be on the threshing floor? This is what I want to touch on and kind of wrap up with this idea. It's mourning. It's affliction. It's weeping. It's grieving. It's preparation for a battle. It is a burial of things that you were holding on to. It is a releasing of. This is oil in the lamp stuff. This is walking in the light as he is in the light. This is what it means to live victoriously in Christ. Genesis 5, 1 through 3, etc. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. He's about to bury Jacob. Joseph commanded his servants to the physicians to embalm his father. What a grief. What a loss. What a letting go. So much loss. So the physicians embalmed Israel, Jacob. Forty days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him for 70 days. Think of the 70 years that God said, I want you to be in Babylon, grieving for you. So Joseph went up to bury his father and with him went all the servants of Pharaoh and the elders of the house and all the elders of the land of Egypt. Look at this in verse 10 says, they came to the threshing floor. You're going to keep seeing the threshing floor is the place where you fall down and weep and mourn and you really see things for what they are. Of Etad, Etad, which is beyond the Jordan. And they mourned there with a great and very solemn lamentation. This is why you're brought to the threshing floor. And he observed seven days of mourning for his father. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a deep mourning of the Egyptians. Therefore, they, its name was called Abel Mizram, which is beyond the Jordan. 
So there is a purpose for the threshing floor. What I'm trying to say is when you avoid this, when you don't come and God shows you the significance of like who your father is and, you know, the various things in which God brought Joseph to, to really grieve and mourn and why it's on the threshing floor, the thrashing, the making peace with this process and understanding the value of it. When you avoid this, you're going to be handed over to something that you wish that you would have been more uh, pliable and more open and more cooperative with the threshing process. Kind of wrap it up with these thoughts. It's going to be Hosea 9, 13. And then uh, what does please God? It's going to be Numbers 15. So it says here in Hosea 9, 1 through 3, Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like those other uh, peoples, for you have played the harlot against your God. So what's going to mean to come out of Babylon as a harlot? You have made love for hire on every what? Threshing floor. Do you understand the significance of this, brother? Sister? You have made love for hire on every Threshing floor, every time God tried to separate you, you made a bargain as a whore makes. You start to whore yourself the second God brings you to the threshing floor every single time. How are you a whore? Every time God exposes you like Pharaoh, like he did with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh almost repented, but then he covered himself with his anger, his pride, his sufficiency, whatever he did, and he bounced back. He hardened his heart. He had a harlot's forehead. He sold himself over because he didn't want to feel naked or vulnerable, and he didn't want to yield himself nor to submit to the greater Lord and to find himself in that vulnerable position. So on the threshing floor is where you make your decisions. When God tests you is where your decision is made to be a virgin or to be a harlot and to have someone else mitigate and meet your needs. Your flesh, your old man, your idol, your Baal, your Molech, whatever it is, we hand ourselves over when we're at the crossroads when God has brought us into a naked point. It was our opportunity to trust in our, quote, Boaz, Ruth scenario of threshing floor. That's where she submitted herself to Boaz. It's there. It's in Ruth chapter three. This is in where the point in which our poverty, our nakedness, our vulnerability, our dis, just uh, our dis in what's the word I'm looking for? Franchisement, disenfranchisement, that were disenfranchised, like a Moabite woman was. And we realize that we're going to have to sit at the feet, be a footstool to somebody until I'm covered. Are you seeing the value of this, the understanding of this? It's at the threshing floor that we make our decisions whether or not to be a harlot or whether or not to be a submissive, patient, faithful virgin to Jesus Christ. Ten virgins. Ten lamps. You want your oil filled? Walk in the light as he is in the light. And he brings us to the threshing floor whether or not we submit as a bride to the bridegroom and trusts in his provisionary care. Wait upon him until this matter is finished. Whether or not he removes the sandal or decides to walk with us. The threshing floor and the wine press shall not feed them. Because of this deal they're making with the flesh and etc. And the new wine shall fail in her. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt. Ephraim joined his idols, guys. And shall eat unclean things. Assyria, right? The husband that did feed. 
Israel and became the harlot for Assyria. Any spiritual application? Hosea 13, verses 1 to 3 says, When Ephraim spoke, trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. This is the weird decisions that we make on the threshing floor. Proud, high-minded, that we talked about earlier in the study. But when he offended through Baal worship, he died. This is a high offense before God, not trusting in him to cover our nakedness in our time of need and vulnerability. Now they sin more and more and have made more for themselves molded images, image, image, images, 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 the church of images, image worship, hiding ourselves, cloaking ourselves in our avatar and in our images, thinking that will feed us idols of their silver according to their own skill set. All of it is the work of craftsmen, their own making. They say of them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. Well, it's the calf worship and going back to Egypt. Honor the calf, honor Satan, honor this false sacrifice. People think that they are very brave and very sacrificial when they take the hand of Satan. Yeah, brave before God. That's bold. Therefore, they shall be like the morning cloud. What is that a picture of? Things that come and things that go. Maybe it served you for the moment, but, and like the early dew that passes away, like chaff blown off the threshing floor and like smoke from a chimney. This is a picture of the wicked when they're destroyed. In order to prepare yourself for the return of Christ and the resurrection into a new body, and to be with him and to be bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, you learn to trust him here. On the threshing floor. Being at peace with that. Finish up these last two references, and then we'll start the next um, study. We'll try to do it soon. As we're kind of on a roll here, and we're going to go right into Ruth chapter 3 and try to understand this threshing floor is the place in which you get your husband, in which you make your decision. It's the crossroad for who your Lord is. Who's your Redeemer? Your idol? Or are you going to submit yourself to a kinsman Redeemer? And place yourself into that vulnerable position. Numbers 15, 13, and verses 20 and 21 says, all who are what? Born again, right? Native born. This is what it's talking about, that you are literally legit children of God, shall do these things in this manner in the presenting of an offering made by what? Fire, fiery trials, affliction, testings. Daniel and his friends, tests. Joseph, tests. Paul, tests. David, tests. Moses, tests. A sweet, swell, a, a sweet aroma to the Lord. So, what's it like, this quote, I am the bread of life? You shall offer up a cake of the first of your ground meal as a heave, heave offering. Very fascinating. Have you ever heaved tears? Have you ever carried a load? A heave offering of the threshing floor, and you shall offer it up. There's significance to this. Of the first of your ground meal, ground, you're going through this process, this grinding. You shall, it's a reasonable sacrifice. This is what's talking about Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You shall give to the Lord a heave offering, offering throughout your generations called sanctification. And is this necessary for preparation for the return of Christ? Did you know that that's the picture of the Feast of Tabernacles? Feast of Tabernacles is you get a new body and you're going to tabernacle with Christ and you're going to be raised from the dead or you'll be given a new tent or a new tabernacle when he arrives in the clouds of glory. In a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, you shall be clothed. 
And this Feast of Tabernacles on the eighth day, it starts on the Sabbath and ends on the Sabbath. On the eighth day, you enter in Psalms 122. Our feet are within thy gates, O Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. And we take the journey with Christ as he, after he comes in the clouds of glory. Is it necessary to be wise brides to have oil in your lamp from a threshing floor experience to be prepared for the great Feast of Tabernacles, which is the return of Christ, and to tabernacle with him throughout all of eternity. And that's the gift we receive. That is the prize he has with him. That is the reward he has. That is a body he has given us. We could dwell with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Is it necessary to go through this threshing floor experience? Is it necessary preparation for the return of Christ? The winnowing, the threshing, the testing, the separation. The cleansing, is it necessary? And we'll finish on Deuteronomy 16, verse 13. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press. Ah. It's here. Let's part two this. This is necessary. A bridegroom is coming. Ruth chapter three, verses two through six. I'll just read it. I won't comment very much on it. It just says, now Boaz, whose young women were with him, is he not our relative? In fact, he's winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Process of sanctification, testing, revelation, trial, separation. Therefore, wash yourselves and anoint yourself. Does it sound like preparation, making her garment ready? Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. Purging, cleansing, no spot nor wrinkle, confession, washing. Don't say you don't have sin. He wouldn't be bringing you through the process if, if you didn't have sin. But do not make yourself known to the man until he is finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall what go in, uncover his feet, lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Trust, rest, abide, waiting to hear his command. Not freaking out, not punching out, not ejecting, not, not running away, not abandoning. Remain, wait. And so she went down to the threshing floor, did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her, and she was a vessel of the Holy Spirit. Okay, guys, that's it. I know this was not uh, as fun of a study as many other studies. I don't even know if I even have fun studies anymore. That's the honest truth. But what this is about is the necessity of making peace and contenting ourselves with what God is putting us through because he knows best and we trust his process. And you're going to have to rely upon his grace becomes sufficient to you as he keeps the thorn in the flesh, as he presses in on your life. And you're going to have to move from a place of a superficial standing afar off, you know, praising him with our lips kind of a mentality to our heart is engaged. Our soul is engaged. Our wholeness of being is engaged. God wants the whole of us. All right, guys. Like I said, it's kind of heartbreaking to know. I'm watching. We went down to one observer. This is hard, and I get that this is not going to be an easy message. So pray for me. Let's pray for one another. I know one thing that this does not uh, make me a popular teacher. I get it. But at least I know that I did my job and that this is out there. This is available to the saints, that these truths can be really meditated upon, can really be masticated, can really be something that it's the gira of the Old Testament, the smallest of coin is the word for cud, where we chomp on it and then we swallow it, we barf it back up, we swallow it again. Thank you, Joseph. You happen to be the only person that remained from the whole study. I know it's painful, guys. I know that we don't want to know because we feel accountable once we've heard these things, but this is necessary preparation for this preparation for the return of Christ. If you are to be Advent people, and if you are looking forward to the return of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the bridegroom cometh, 
we are to know these things, to be in full cooperative relationship with the work of the Holy Spirit and enter into this place in which we can make peace so we could be ready to even evangelize like Jonah. We'll get into Jonah. We'll get into Ruth. We'll get into Job on our next study. These three very interesting uh, people that went through the process. Hey, Sergio, good to see you. It's very necessary, you guys, that we embrace this and that we rejoice. And you're going to see when we get further into the study that through Jeremiah and et cetera, you're going to, and through Isaiah, there's going to be more on these studies. Here, well, I'll show you, just give you a little bit of a, like what's still here. Isaiah, there's more Isaiah here. There's Deuteronomy, there's Jeremiah, these type of things. This threshing floor idea, go ahead and look up threshing floor and understand that it's the work of the Holy Spirit in us having to realize that paying your vows is more like being at peace with the fact that this is what it means to be a disciple, to carry your cross, pay your dues. Isn't really this idea that you're earning salvation, but that if you're engaged with Christ, you're going to go through this process. And there's real fruit from this. There's real results. There's real weight of treasure that comes from all of this. And you will not be saved without this. You will not be prepared for eternal life without this. If you shrink back into the darkness of these old narratives in which we somehow have insulated ourselves and have found a way to live in some kind of fanci fanciful narrative for ourselves to accommodate, to customize ourselves, to make God in our own image. This is the true idolatry that we are to flee from, to seek Christ as he is revealed in his word, not according to how we could somehow cobble together our own version of Jesus so we could live and somehow tell sweet narratives to ourselves so we could live inside of our body and continue to march on in presumptuous lies only to be destroyed in the end. Why would anyone do that for you? Why would you follow them? Why would that be your teacher? What about being taught the truth and then allowing the Holy Spirit to come in to do that very, very powerful work in our life so we could really know his mercy, really know his grace, and really give a true testimony of him? That's it, guys. All right, God bless. Let's keep one another in prayer, especially me and this ministry in prayer. Uh, it's not without its own threshing. <laughs> As I said, I just went through uh, three days of kidney stones. Uh, I was literally beating my own body on the floor. I really enjoyed the illustration in my own life. And uh, I'm still, you know, kind of uh, still ready to pass uh, another stone and uh, keep me in prayer. If the stone that came brought me to the floor, what about the stone of Daniel too? And the weeping and gnashing of teeth that will happen there. All right, guys, God bless. Thank you. Keep each other in prayer. Keep me in prayer.